Hey, before we get started, just a heads up that we've got some awesome stuff on BJJ Mental Models Premium you probably want to know about. We've got some collaborative work with Andrew Wiltsey, with Margot Ciccarelli, and with John Thomas. At the moment, we're getting close to about 50 hours of premium stuff on there, and the library is always growing. Highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. There's a free trial, so there's no risk. If you try it and you don't like it, I'll happily refund it because I'm pretty sure that you will like it. Hundreds of other people already do. Please do check it out if you haven't already. Premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. One more time, that's premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Thanks again for supporting us, and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 183. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. Joined again here today by Mr. Matt Kirtley. How are you doing, Matt? Doing pretty good. Glad to be here. Glad to have you back, my friend. And a lot has happened since the last time you joined us on the podcast. I understand that you've got a gym now, don't you? Yeah, in a way. I'm partnered with Inverta Gear, who opened an academy, Nelson and Hillary, and I was going to be their gym manager. I helped set up all their internet stuff. And then I got another job at a big <laughs> digital marketing company. So now they have a different gym manager, but I'm still teaching and helping with their logistics. Well, hey, if there's one thing that that tells me, it's that you're the perfect guest for this conversation today, which is all about your gym's website. It sucks. How can we make it better? <laughs> and it sounds like you are probably the guy to help with this conversation. Now, the backstory here, I get a lot of questions about this. I just haven't really ever had a forum or the right guest to do a whole conversation on it. But a lot of people ask me, hey, Steve, I've got a gym regarding my website for the gym. How do I do X, Y, Z? What are best practices for ABC? People always have questions about their gym website, whether they should make any changes, invest further in the development of the thing, and if, if there's any diminishing returns at some point in doing so. Now, this is going to be an interesting talk because both you and I are web developer guys. So probably this is an area where <laughs> between this and jujitsu, we have some interesting experience and maybe some interesting lessons that we can share. So my hope here is that we can put together a little care package for gym owners or even just gym admins or managers and give them some guidance on how they can maximize the value they get out of their gym website. But with all that said, Matt, maybe for those who don't know you or missed your earlier episode with us, do you want to just give a quick intro? Sure. So I am a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, as you might have guessed from being on this show, but I've been training since about 2004. I've been doing web design and search engine optimization since before that. My first job out of high school was working at a web agency as like an intern, apprentice sort of. And then I just have had various internet jobs ever since. Uh, the last few years, I had been working for a small agency that mostly worked with local businesses, not necessarily local to me, but a, meaning that they were local to like the serving a local area. So like a plumber, electrician, yoga studios. And then the agency I'm at now is much bigger. I do much larger accounts for big corporations, but a lot of the same rules will still apply. Anything else there I should add about who I am? Aesopian.com is maybe how you know me. <laughs> That's right. You are also like the king of Reddit, right? You're one of the mods there as well. Aesopian is probably, although I think we established in the last episode we did together that is actually Aesopian and you've been pronouncing it wrong your entire life, right? Yeah, I know how to say it, but everyone says it wrong. So I say it the same way. I believe it's Aesopian. Either way, either way, you're easy guy to find online. But all of this goes to show that you're probably uniquely qualified to give some advice here on this weird world where BJJ and web development intersect. And this is an experience that every gym owner is going to have to go through at some point. Uh, website expenses can also be a pretty major thing when it comes to getting your your business off the ground as well. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on on your website, but to establish and get your tech ops up and running, even for a gym, which is relatively non-technical, there's still going to be some cost here. And mm -hmm. a big factor that comes up a lot when you're building a gym website is how much cost should I actually sink into this thing? Now, you know, and I know that if you want to build like a tech company and you want to build a <laughs> web-based product, you can easily sink millions, if not billions of dollars into development of that thing. But 
It's also possible using existing tools and products to get a really basic website off the ground with relatively low cost. I mean, there might be some investment in time just in terms of learning the tools, but that's definitely a viable option. And a question that often gets put onto my plate is people ask, are there diminishing returns to this? You know, does it make sense if I'm a gym owner to pay someone thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars to build some big fancy custom web portal? Or am I better off just setting up a Squarespace account and just using something basic? There's a lot of questions that kind of fall onto this, but maybe just to get going, if you've got kind of a, an intro here and some central ideas as to what you normally recommend, I definitely love to give you the platform. Yeah. My idea would be to think of it like when I was getting ready for this talk. I was thinking about someone who just doesn't really know where to start. They have no real web experience, but they you know how to answer emails and use a Word document. And that's about the extent of their web. Maybe they updated their MySpace profile with some custom uh, fonts at some point. And for them, I'd say you do not need to build a big, huge, crazy website. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars. You don't need a web developer. Though you could do all those things if you just really want to over develop it. If you want a lot of really fancy photos, maybe, or to really knock people's socks off with how cool your website looks, but you do not need that in order to have a good website that gets people to sign up that people can find. You can really go basic on it and just some nice, just take some photos with your phone and upload them. It'll be enough to get you started and where you should build your website. Uh, you don't have to have big costs. Like you brought up Squarespace. Honestly, I recommend stuff like that to people all the time. I say, if you don't have time, you don't have money. There are all kinds of solutions like that now that are so much easier to get going. Squarespace, Wix even. There's a thing too. When you're going to register your domain, all those companies where you can get a domain name will have some bundle where they want you to go on to having hosting with them too. And there's a thing now called managed WordPress, which is where they're just going to install a WordPress for you and kind of try to make it act a bit like uh, those other sites like Squarespace and Wix. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, what I mean is having a editor that's very friendly to use where you just kind of build the page, how it will look in the editor. And then you don't have to do any coding. You don't have to really get advanced if you don't know how. And so you have a spectrum now of Wix and Squarespace where you, you also can often buy your domain through them or get it for free as a bundle. And they'll, you know, then you're not having to care about updating your server, worrying about security patches or anything because the Squarespace and Wix will handle all that for you. There's no versions to worry about. There's no risk that your plugins will all break because they are too old and they don't, they're not compatible anymore. But if you want a bit more control, then you go with a WordPress one. And if you want a lot more control, you can get hosting and then install WordPress yourself. And that would let you have complete control over how it gets built out. So those would be my main options. And then the other one, this is one you could do depending on what you use, is if you have a gym management software, those often build out a little website for you. They're often pretty basic, but I've seen those rank great in search engines. So don't knock them. They actually do just fine because they already have all of your gym info in them, schedule, booking, instructor bios, all that can be usually included in the gym management software. And then it will generate a little website for you that you can hook up to a domain. So it's a whole spectrum there. I've seen all of those work. It just depends on what level of familiarity you have with each of those. And they're all roughly about the same cost. If you're already paying for a gym management software, then that one's kind of rolled into the cost, but you could, I was just looking, you can get managed WordPress hosting for $4 a month. So it's not, it's not rough. You're not going to need much more than that if you're just a little local gym. Yeah, that's all good advice here. I mean, I can give some context for BJJ Mental Models, which is obviously not a gym, but we do have a web presence. We use a very, very simple WordPress hosted instance like you talked about. We basically use the plan where we we have them manage the whole thing for us. And yeah, it comes to like 20 bucks US a month. It's really not that big a deal. Squarespace and other services like that are competitive with that price. If you're just looking for a basic website in a box and you want to be able to choose a nice template and then just punch in content, those are a lot of good options. 
with WordPress. WordPress used to be the the big thing back in the day. It used to be the platform for blogging. At this point in time, I think in a lot of ways, it's probably been eclipsed by a lot of the other options like you brought up. I mean, Squarespace is a really prominent one. Wix, I, I'm familiar with, but I've never used myself, although it does look interesting. But there's a ton of these options out there. However, they all will basically, if you're a business, they seem to be kind of trying to steer you, at least as of this writing, into a like 20 to 30 US dollar a month tier roughly that's kind of where the the price point for a lot of these guys lands and honestly for a website that's a pretty good deal (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. you brought up the possibility of hosting it yourself which you can also do and that used to be the way that people always did this back before cloud hosting was a thing people would set up their own server i mean i remember you know 15 20 years ago i literally had a a server (laughs) to, to call it as much it was basically just a crap little computer sitting in my house that was hosting a website so if you went to my website it was just loading up a web page that was being served off of a computer in my house i would even as a technical person myself there are very few situations now where i would recommend someone do that very few situations there's no need anymore unless you just have a hobby of doing that yes but in terms of ease of use and keeping it maintained and knowing that's going to be online and your cat's not going to unplug it or anything having any of these services they're all about the same there's no one i would say is going to give you an edge over another I've used them all. They're all fine. They all get the job done. Yeah. Now, the one thing to bear in mind is that, of course, if you choose one, you normally have to do a lot of administrative setup work and choosing templates and finagling the content into the format you want. So switching from one to the other is not as easy as you'd think because you have to migrate all of your stuff. So it is worth exploring and making sure you make the right choice out of the gate. But generally speaking, all of those services are usually going to be pretty good. And it's often not that one is bad compared to the others. It's more just that they might have varying feature sets and that you might be better off with one versus another, depending on what you're looking to do. Like I said, I use WordPress. The reason I chose WordPress for what we do, granted, it's a very, very simple website that we use. But the reason I chose WordPress is because WordPress has one of the biggest libraries of third-party plugins that you can plug Mm -hmm. into. So if WordPress doesn't have the features you need, there's probably a plugin that you can use to get those features. Whereas other web hosting sites, you know, they might not have the same depth of plugins that WordPress does. So that's why we went there. Honestly, I haven't loved WordPress. It's kind of clunky in a lot of ways. Its age very much shows. And so I'm I'm not saying that I would necessarily recommend it, but that said, it does remain a viable option, specifically if you need to start integrating in with other platforms and things like that. And just, I like to have my options open, so that's why I chose that. But if I were a non-technical person just looking for a basic website, I'd probably start off by looking at something like Squarespace or Wix would be my suggestion. The one thing like you brought up, very, very rarely do you want to consider trying to host it yourself. The main reason why is because it takes a lot of work and a lot of expertise to keep a website secure. And if you're trying to do this yourself, there's a good chance you're going to forget to patch things or not even know what to patch and your site's going to be out of date and someone's going to hack you. Whereas if you do cloud hosting, like you said, they will take care of that for you, which is definitely one of the biggest perks to using a hosted service like that. Yeah. I don't know anyone that hosts their own stuff anymore, (laughs) really. Like Mm -hmm. for a single person website, I know some big corporations that will do that for their own security, but not for, for that with your Jiu-Jitsu website. No, just grab one of these virtual hosts, bundled hosts. They'll, they'll do a good job for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now you did bring up a great point, which is that a lot of other tangential products can often manage your website for you. So for instance, your gym software, Mm -hmm. if you have a product that you already pay for to manage things like attendance and pay payments for your students and, you know, whether someone is due for promotion, there's a lot of gym tools like that out there. Some of them do also allow you to build out a straightforward website directly within their, their product. So if you're already paying for gym software to manage your gym, And if that software has the capability to build your website, probably makes sense that that be the first thing you look at. Yeah, take a look. I'd say often those are ugly. That's my main complaint is they're very... It's a good point. They're usually not very appealing, but they're getting better. I've seen them rank well, though, meaning they often can um, still rank in the search engines. Google doesn't really care if your website's ugly as long as the information's there. So WordPress would give you the most control over what your site looks like, 
which means it could look really nice if you know what you're doing, but also it, it can be hard to set up if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, we did a mixed thing for Inverta Gear. We're using a gym management software that could generate the website, but instead we have a WordPress site and then we have embedded within that the contact forms and the lead capture forms are actually little widgets, meaning little embedded uh, gym management forms. So the leads go right into the gym management software, but to the user, it just looks like one website. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a pretty common approach too. I mean, we do something similar as well, where the public facing website uses WordPress, but the premium website, we use Teachable as the back end. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have to feel like one tool needs to solve all of your problems. It might be better for you to shell out the extra 20 bucks and get another tool in there and use one for your public website and one for your back end. There's no rule saying that you have to use them the same. It's also worth pointing out that for a lot of gyms, especially in the early stages, they might not yet be at the point where they can justify paying for a full gym management product suite. You know, if you are just starting your gym mm -hmm. and you want to use a gym management tool that's trying to charge you 150 bucks a month, that might be more of a cost than you're ready to eat yet. You know, you can get a gym grown to a pretty big size before you actually really feel the pain and need an automated gym management platform. You know, it's, it's not impossible to run a gym with 200 students out of basically a spreadsheet if you want to. So that's something to consider, which is that, you know, you shouldn't feel pressured to buy one of those gym management tools just because you need a website. But at some point in your gym's growth, you're probably going to need that just because the process of tracking all of those payments, following up with people whose credit cards bounce or get declined, tracking where your students are and when, you know, what their major milestones are, sending out blast emails when you have an update for your, your club, all of that stuff gets very cumbersome and manual at some point. So it's pretty much inevitable that every gym that is successful will eventually need gym management software. But if cost is a consideration, you can usually skimp on that for the first year or two while you're growing. Yeah, I feel like there are some good options, even if you don't have a high budget. I think there are some good small management softwares that you could use even if you, even for free, I think for some of them, if you're not processing too many payments. But then once you reach a certain point, probably the point where you can afford it, they'll want you to upgrade and actually pay for it. So it, it'll save you so many headaches in the long run, though, to get on a, a system for that as soon as you can that will handle your payments, decline credit cards, lead management some of your automated marketing of sending out emails, sending out texts, all that stuff. It's nice to have in the gym management software that can cook it all together so that a person goes from being a lead, meaning they're just someone who filled out a form on your website to a contacted lead where you're recording all of your interactions with them. Like if you're sending them messages, calling them, texting them, there's a place to record all that, getting them capturing their waivers. So when they're filling out their liability waivers, when they come in, and then, you know, converting them over to a student if they sign up. And then it, you have that whole, you have one system that can track a person all the way across to becoming a student and see the history of the account, which that becomes more valuable if your gym is growing to the point where you're going to bring on other people to help you manage it, where it's hard. If one person's just juggling all that in their head or they have it all on their personal email or their personal text messages, and then you bring in somebody else. And then you're like, uh, how do I share this workload? How do I have any sense of continuity if I'm out sick and someone else needs to take over? All those things, you want a system that's going to keep it in one place and have uh, record keeping. Yeah, it's all well and good to just juggle all of that stuff in your head. And you can do that up to a point. But as soon as you get to the point where you have an employee or someone else that you're bouncing responsibilities off of internally, the ability to get all of this stuff into a central tracking system, you know, we, you're talking about gym management software here, but basically what we're looking for is in the business world, what you call CRM features, right? Mm -hmm. Customer relationship management to be able to track the life cycle of a customer and what their touch points were with your business and where they left off. That becomes important because look, if you're the only person that works at your company, yeah, sure. Maybe you can remember all of the customer interactions, but if you've got an employee or two and they call in sick or they quit and and now you've got to pick up where they left off. You definitely want to make sure it's easy to keep a full trail of everything that happened with those customers and make sure it's not living in someone's mailbox that you may have now lost access to. On that point, one of the main things I'd recommend is go and create a new Google account, a Gmail and everything account uh, for your gym. 
And when you go and you're registering your domains, your hosting, you're getting, put it all to that gym email so that it's all in one place. And also, if you bring on an employee, if you have another gym manager, you don't have to share your personal account with them. You can have a gym account so that all the logins are centralized and you're not going to worry that someone's going to be snooping through your personal Facebook or your personal Gmail and you're not having to give out that that stuff. You can have multiple accounts logged in on the same computer. So you get home, you could have both, but then you have that gym computer and you don't need to share the rest of your personal data with uh, whoever else might sit down at that desk. Well, that's actually something that is worth touching on because it's incredibly important and most people don't even think about this until it's way too late. I see so many gyms and gym instructors out there. In fact, I would say the vast majority of gym instructors that I've seen, they don't even have a branded gym email address. They will have some personal at gmail.com address that they use and they say, look, if you want to contact us, just send an email here and it's my personal Gmail. I even see people who have fucking hotmail accounts of all things <laughs> baffles me i still have a hotmail account i've never retired but i don't actively <laughs> i don't actively use it but like every every once a year i go look at what's still being sent there it's like i had it since i was in high school yep same thing here i've got an old legacy hotmail and i'm afraid to kill it just in case some important account has the forgot password feature tied to that thing but yeah same thing with me it's 2022 people. You don't need Hotmail. But even beyond just the professionalism, you know, it's it's nice to have a branded domain. It's always better to, you know, have like at mygym.com for an email domain instead of at Gmail or at Hotmail. Even beyond that, it's important because then you can keep the data. And like you said, then you don't need to share your accounts. What you don't want is to have like one Gmail account that all of the instructors share. Because Oh, no, not a personal one, maybe a gym one. Maybe, but even then shared accounts and shared passwords are dangerous. I mean, we have had issues at my gym where the wrong person wound up with access to that account and they did some damage, right? That That is the kind of thing that you got to be careful of. And this is mm -hmm. an enterprise concern with any enterprise business. But even as a smaller company, this will burn you before you expect it to, right? You generally don't want to have shared accounts like that. And you also, especially in a sport that is as drama ridden as jujitsu is, but even beyond that, if you're letting people use their personal hotmails, you don't have access to their data. So if you ever have some sort of issue at your gym and you need to investigate it, it becomes problematic if people were using their personal accounts because you don't know what was said. So all of this is to say that you should probably go to, you know, again, you mentioned G Suite. I recommend that as well. Google mm -hmm. G Suite is a great solution for quickly, cheaply setting up branded emails so you can set up email at a very cost effective way for yourself for all of the people in your gym and then you control that and you can cut off their access or give out access as you see fit and you retain all of that data it's an expense that you probably will be really really happy you paid for down the road and it's not that expensive it costs a few bucks per person per month so i mean for even for personal use i pay for this feature so i would definitely consider using a hosted branded email solution just to get stuff out of people's personal gmail and hotmail accounts yeah. And then plus, if you're using G Suite, which again, I'm going to kind of have to shell for Google on this because we're going to use them a bunch when we get into how to do SEO. That's your main target is Google rankings. But then you also have a, a gym Google Docs. So if you're working on documents, writing up rules, keeping spreadsheets, doing a gym YouTube, all that stuff is all Google. So you can have it all in one place. And uh, that makes it a lot easier to manage if you're all know where it's going and where all the documents are. You're not just having to dig around around or, I mean, I've seen this happen. Like someone has a gym manager who takes over, the gym manager sets up all the stuff for them, meaning they set up a Google My Business listing, they set up a Facebook page, they set up all these things. And then that person quits, leaves, dead to them, whatever drama happens. And then you lose control of all your stuff. Yep. Or it, maybe it's not, not even on bad terms. I Unfortunately, like when I was at that small company, I had to help people because they're like, oh, our son, our, you know, our son who had to do computers. So he set up all our stuff and he died. He was just tragically, he died. And we don't know how to access anything anymore. We don't know how to get into our email. We don't know how to get into our, our Google, my business listing. We don't know how to reclaim any of this stuff. And we were having to go through all these very difficult processes where you have to prove that you should be, have access to something to these big tech companies who don't, you know, they're worried that you're phishing or that you're stealing the the account. And you're just like, no, the guy who had it, like he died and we don't know any of his logins. 
Yeah, that's that's a tragic situation. And there's a lot of scenarios where if you're not paying attention to who has access to what, you can either wind up losing access to important systems and having trouble getting it back, or you could find out that too many people have access to things and something bad happens. And now I know a lot of people will listen to this and they'll say, well, my employee, my my coach, he's a, my best friend and we've been friends for 20 years and trained together for our whole jujitsu careers and he would never betray me. So I'm totally comfortable giving him access to all of my personal stuff. This is not an issue for me. I know a lot of people are going to feel that way, but to that I say two things. Number one, you have no idea what's going to happen, right? People do crazy things in business and bridges get burned all the time. And number two, even if that bridge doesn't get burned and this person is your best buddy and you totally trust them, what if they get hacked, right? If they Mm -hmm. get hacked and they've got access to your stuff, then now all of your stuff is exposed. This is one of the most common ways that people get hacked into is, you know, too many people have access to the important accounts. One of those people gets hacked. And because the passwords were shared so widely, now the hacker has access to very sensitive and important information. So it's always good to clamp down on that stuff, even if you're a very small business. Yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with not trusting a person. It just has to do with understanding systems will always become compromised and limiting the damage that can be caused by that. Someone logging into something they shouldn't log into, a person getting a virus, a person getting fished. You just don't want it to be where that happens. And then it's your personal life, your business life, all your business accounts. Like, So dividing it up well, so like business stuff is going to a business account, individual employees at your gym have their own little accounts, and you're not going to have that problem. So all of this probably starts to sound a little bit overwhelming for a lot of people, especially non-technical people. And I think we can safely assume that most jujitsu gym owners are very non-technical. I mean, it's funny because you see all of these black belts talk about, you know, iron sharpens iron and we want to be a warrior and growth from discomfort and never run away from a challenge and only the strong survive. But they will run screaming away from any problem relating to computers. (laughs) As soon as there's an issue pertaining to computers, they don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. So for a lot of non-technical people, they're probably going to listen to this and just be completely overwhelmed out of the gate. And the question then becomes, okay, well, do you need to hire? Do you think that for people who are kind of setting up their their tech infrastructure for a gym, so their website and all of these systems, does it make sense, Matt, to hire someone to take care of all of this? Or would you recommend that most gym owners just bite the bullet and learn and do it themselves? I think you can bite the bullet. Seeing how good gym owners are at like reposting things to Instagram and all that, like they can figure it out. Like it's not much harder than that kind of stuff. If you just sit and take your time, it's not that hard to figure out how to create a Gmail account. It's not that hard to go pick a plan and buy a a hosting. It's just having to do the steps. I'm not good at this stuff because I'm a genius. I just read the instructions. (laughs) You know, people, how, how do you troubleshoot that computer problem? I don't know. Google tells you how to do all this stuff. If you just read it, <laughs> like you can just look it up. Yeah. If you can Google how to do a dead orchard and learn that and apply that, then you can Google how to set up a WordPress website. It's really not that much more difficult. Yeah. And we're not, and we're not talking about like, okay, you got to set up your DNS and now you've got to go in and you've got to FTP up your install files and blah, blah. No, it's just like, go to a good host. There's all kinds of hosting companies. Look for the plan. And it's probably called WordPress hosting. Find the one that's probably between four to twenty dollars a month. Buy it. It will show you what to do. They make it really, really easy these days. You'll pick out some themes. You can kind of shop around. You can there's free themes, meaning that's what your website will look like. The general layout, colors, where the logos go, where the photos can be dropped in. They've got all this stuff now where you can just click on it and say, I like that one. And they go, okay, it's installed. And you're not having to edit code. You're not having to do configuration files. None of that. That's all taken care of you for these days. Yeah. If you want to get advanced beyond that, then maybe you need to hire somebody in like if you're going to like really custom develop something. But for most people, Squarespace is trying to help you not have to know anything. Now, the one thing that likely will trip people up, and a lot of people find this complicated, even technical people, is managing DNS. That Mm -hmm. stuff often does become a problem for people. Now, like you said, if you don't already own a website domain, and and the website domain, by the way, is the thing that people type in to get to your website. So, you know, www.mygym.com. If you don't already own a domain for your website, like Matt said, a lot of these providers, I know WordPress will, 
they'll let you buy that domain and plug it in and set up the website all in one go, which is super simple compared to the alternative. Now, the alternative is if you already have that domain, you've already purchased it, and now you need to set up a hosting provider and connect them together, that part is a little bit technical. And even technical people often struggle to do this a little bit. The good news is most of the providers are well aware of this. And so they have very good support processes to get this fixed. So if you have that problem... Yeah, they'll help you through that because that is probably the hardest part if you don't know what you're doing. But they know that's a necessary first step for you to do to be on their service. So they make it, they'll help you do that. You call their support, you talk to their chat, they'll guide you through it. Yeah. And for those who don't know what DNS is, domain name service, basically what it is, it's like a giant yellow pages. And maybe that's a dated reference and maybe I'm I'm old and (laughs) people don't even know what that is anymore. But basically it's the place where when someone goes and they type in an address in their web browser, like www.google.com, I want to go to Google. DNS is the service that basically figures out, okay, who is that person and where do they live and how do I send you to the right place? So which web server do I send you to? It's like a giant yellow pages. So when you go in your browser and you type in an address, DNS is the way that that gets looked up and your browser figures out, okay, where's the server that's hosting this thing that I need to go get it from? If you want to have a website or custom email, DNS is the most important thing because if you don't have that, then really nobody can find your site unless they know the IP address, which is a different thing altogether that we won't get into. But that is an area that does get a little bit dicey and complicated. So be ready to take a stiff drink when it comes time to link up your DNS records. Be ready to hop on the phone with support. And that is probably the place where you're going to need to talk to your computer friend if you need some help in this whole process. Yeah. In the end, it's not super hard. It's just easy to make like a little typo and then things are broken for yeah. an hour and then you fix it and you got to wait for it because it takes a, the way DNS works. It doesn't instantly work like because it's just like re- routinely updated, but not instantly updated database of our directory. So sometimes you screw some up DNS thing up and you're like, oh crap, my website's going to be down for like two hours and then you fix it. That is the problem, right? It's not like if you make a mistake with the DNS, you can just go in and fix it and then it's fixed. It may take several hours, sometimes even days for the change to take effect. So if you make the wrong change, you won't know right away. And if you break something, it could be hours or even days before it's fixed. So DNS is the dicey part. But like I said, just be aware of that. And that's the reason why so many of these services offer excellent support when it comes to setting up your DNS. And the good news is DNS is usually a one and done thing. It's kind of a bugger to set up. But once you do it, you'll probably never have to look at it again unless you switch hosts at some point and get a new web service provider. Yeah, you might need, I think you need to touch it if you're going to set up a G Suite, Google's business suite. Yeah, but you can kind of do that all in one go if you want. So they can hook up to your email. But again, they'll have a bunch of documents to help you do that and help, help documents and probably a support line that would guide you through. Right. Now, one thing that you brought up earlier was SEO. And I think everyone has heard of SEO, search engine optimization, but it's probably worth explaining exactly what it is and how it works. Because I think even to this day, there's a misunderstanding about what SEO is. I think people think it's some sort of like trickery that you do to make (laughs) search engines happy, but it's not really productive to think of it that way. In fact, usually the more you try to trick the search engine, the worse it's going to be for you. But there are some best practices and good ideas when it comes to how to make your site friendly so that search engines can find you. So with that said, Matt, I would ask you, why don't you introduce SEO and just explain to people what it is and what they need to do? So at this point, I'll say Google, because that's generally what we're talking about. We're search engine, but usually Google, that's going to be most of your business. Giving them the information they need in the format they need to understand it so that they can rank you. And there's little things you can do to, to optimize that, meaning if they're, they're going to think that you're a higher quality or more relevant, they'll show you higher up in the search results. And there's things you could do to make it harder for them. So putting the information on your website in a way that is difficult for their system to understand, to to gain context and figure out what you're doing. And the optimization part comes down to just knowing how to build out the site so that you're giving the smoothest crawl of the website. So the search engine, when it gets there, it's able to find all the content, download it, parse it, meaning to pick it apart, pull out what the important things are. And then once it does that, go, is this page better or worse than other things I could show for this? And in really hyper-competitive fields, you know, e-commerce or very 
high, high traffic things, then this can be very cutthroat and very exacting. And there's little micro adjustments people are making to their website to try to rank. But uh, jujitsu websites are not that competitive compared to those industries. And it's just making sure that you give Google very clear instructions on what you do, where you are, what you offer. And if you can do that, Google is probably going to treat you pretty well. And uh, especially understanding the intent of the person searching is a big deal of knowing like, I need to make it clear to Google that if someone's looking for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu classes in the town I'm in, they should find me. Yep. And that's pretty much it. And I would say in some ways more important than your website these days is going to be the your Google business listing. That's that listing when you look for something and Google says, I bet they're looking for a local business. You'll get three businesses thrown up in, near the top of the search results highlighted and then a little Google Maps on the side or underneath it. That's its own little thing. That's a thing you can set with Google for free and you definitely should do it. And it just has all your business info. So it's got your website hours, phone number, address. You can add photos. You can do all sorts of things. When you create that Google account, I said you should create for your gym. One of your stops will be going to Google. It used to be called My Business. Now it's just called Business Profile and setting that up because that will probably drive you more traffic than your website will. The website will probably end up on your, some of it will end up on your website. Some of that traffic will end up on your website, but it it's probably going to show you the person that first before they show that blue link of the traditional one through 10 links that are the, you know, am I number one? Am I number two? It's probably going to show that first. It's going to say, hey, here's three local businesses I think fit what you're looking for. Yeah. To the best extent possible, what you want to do is understand what people are likely going to be searching for. And this requires you to put yourself in their head and take yourself out of your head. And that's an important thing to understand because a lot of the time, what you as an instructor might think people want is totally different from what the lay person who doesn't know your business is going to want, right? A lot of the things that in the jujitsu landscape, we care a lot about like IBJJF world championships, blah, 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 blah. I'm not even sure if the majority of hobbyists even know what that kind of stuff is, right? Most of them are going to search jujitsu plus the name of their city, and they're going to click on whatever comes up first, right? In terms of yep. SEO. And so if you aren't accommodating that, if you're trying to stuff with all sorts of things like the name of your affiliation, like Alliance or Gracie Baja or whatever, right in the name. I mean, unless you have reason to believe that your customers actually are going to know what Gracie Baja is, and they're going to specifically want to search and find a Gracie Baja gym, that's probably not a great target, right? It's probably better to think about what your customers are going to be searching for. And like like you said, if you can get at the top of that listing, that's absolutely the best because a lot of people are not going to scroll down further. I mean, I think of myself as a technologist and I got to admit when I joined jujitsu, all I did was I searched for BJJ Vancouver. I clicked the first result and I stayed at that gym for two and a half years, even though it <laughs> frankly sucked, but I didn't know any better. Right. So it's important to put your best foot forward and to try to be the first thing that people see when they search. And a good strategy for that, like you said, is to understand what what people are going to search for. Another strategy, like you said, is to go beyond just thinking, okay, how can I make the Google search engine happy, but also to take advantage of the other services Google offers, like their business listings or their ads, which can get you placed above the search listings anyway. Yeah. If you let's think about what shows up on a search and also what the person might be looking at when they're searching, they could be on a computer that will get them one presentation of their search results and more and more and more, they're going to be looking on their phone. And so on the phone, things will be more likely targeting the like immediate answers because Google knows you just got this tiny little screen and you're probably out doing something and you just want something right away. So at the top of those search results is going to be an ad. So you can pay for that placement if you want to get into Google ads. And then it's if it's anything Google thinks is local, like a business you're looking for, a service, a thing you want to do around you. Those results will pull in three businesses it thinks can match that. And Google has an understanding that it builds understandings. It knows Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a martial art. It knows Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is also BJJ. It knows Jiu Jitsu is, you know, spelled different ways, could be the same thing. And it'll just try to fill those in because you'll see sometimes if you search for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu near me and you're in a place with no Jiu Jitsu, 
Google still wants to show you something, so it might show you karate gyms or kung fu schools because it knows martial arts is what you're looking for. But if there was a jujitsu gym, it would pick that first. So I'd say you're right on. People don't know the name of your affiliation. They don't know the name of these famous black belts. They're probably looking for very straightforward searches. BJJ, name of city. Jiu-jitsu, name of city. Martial arts, self-defense. Maybe the word classes is in there. Free trial might be in there. So just say all those things on your website. Say, we're a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school that teaches martial arts and self-defense. Sign up for a free trial. Classes run and you know give your schedule. And that will show Google... Those are all the things this person wants. And the address is on the website. The website is connected to this listing that I have. I have high confidence in the listing being correct because when you sign up for the Google My Business listing, they're going to mail you a postcard. They're going to prove you really have a business there. So they're going to be very confident in showing somebody this is a local business. They've proved they actually exist. And when all those things line up, it just each of those things you can provide to Google is going to raise its confidence that it's giving a person the relevant information they need and it's matching their intent in the situation they're in at the time. They're, they're out driving around searching for something. Google's going, I bet they want it like local. If someone just types in jujitsu, not a name of a city, not near me, Google's probably going to show them like Wikipedia or some other big website because it's like, I don't know. It doesn't, that's a, maybe they're just researching the topic. But as soon as you add in a city near me, classes, that's the kind of stuff where Google goes, oh, you want to do this. You want to find a place. Now, let's say that all of this goes according to plan. Someone sees your gym on the web in their search results. They click on it. They load up your website. What are the essential things that really need to be on that gym website? And are there any things that you would suggest not including on the gym website? It needs to be obvious who you are. So your name and a logo. It should be very obvious how to contact you. So your phone number and your address should be very easy to find. Your contact form should be very easy to find. And these days, people always have these little uh, live chat things on there too. So if you want to do that, you can add a live chat function as long as you really have somebody there to to answer it. And it's pretty straightforward for jujitsu gyms. People want to know if there's a free trial and you should be making that very obvious. You should have a call to action, which means having usually the thing you want the person to do, fill out a form get their name, their phone number, their email, get that at least that much out of them so you can follow up on the lead. And then they're probably looking for what do you offer? What's the schedule? They're maybe looking for some FAQs. You know, what do I need to bring? How can I start? And I, people often have a misconception about how gyms run because they're thinking of how schools run and they're going, oh, can I just start any time or is, do I, am I waiting for a semester to start? Is there like a program I need to join at the beginning of? They don't know. We just sign you up whenever. That's sometimes a confusion people have. So just making it clear. We're, yes, you can sign up right now. Yes, we're open these hours and making it very easy for them to get in touch with you, to ask their questions. You're going to get, if you have a live chat function, you're going to get a little Hey, can my son sign up? I don't see the age. You know, if you didn't include this, I don't see how old they need to be. Hey, I'm dropping in from out of town. Do is there a drop-in fee or get stuff like that? So giving all those basics, schedule, address, who the instructors are, little bios, and then people can dig in and figure out that's where you can include your affiliation, your instructors, your credentials, your awards, your tournament record. But now let me ask a question here for you. Do you need to include a section on your website that explains what is BJJ. Because most of the gym websites that I've seen, pretty much right out of the bat, they've got some big explanation introducing, here's what Brazilian (laughs) Jiu-Jitsu is, here's the history of the sport, and they'll devote a significant amount of their homepage to explaining what the sport is themselves. And I've always wondered, is that a good idea? Because I would kind of assume that pretty much anyone who's landed on the site probably already knows that stuff, and it would be more productive to tell them why they should come to your gym and how to do that, rather than giving them a history lesson. But that said, I know a lot of gyms do this, and I'm just wondering if you think it, there's a good reason for that. I think the reason is just people aren't good at writing sales copy. <laughs> and it's very easy to just be like, I don't know, what, what would I say about it? Oh, it's a martial art, came from jujitsu in Japan, and... Oh, it has traces its lineage back to Pancration. Alexander the Great basically did it. No, you can include whatever you want in the, about the history on the site 
maybe an FAQ or what is like a, what is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu page. But I think your homepage should just like upfront be like, here's some happy people doing martial arts in your photos. You want to sign up? Here's how you sign up. If you're still reading, here's all these benefits of jujitsu, why you want to start and how it's so fun. And you can lose weight and get in shape and all the usual reasons people give. So learn self-defense, have fun. Don't just run on a treadmill. If you want to lose weight, you can come do this. And then just give them opportunities to sign up. Probably the first thing on your site should almost just be like that smiling face in a form that says, come join us, fill out this form and you get a free trial. Yep. I generally recommend that if you're building a gym website, the first and most important thing that people should see is how do I how do I send you a message? How do I talk to you? How do I contact you? Because the goal of your gym website for most people is I want to get you to start a conversation with us because as soon as they start talking to you, it's a lot more likely that you're going to be able to get them in the doors and you're going to be able to close the sale. So if there's anything on your website that is distracting or taking up space, to prevent people from just being able to sign up or get in touch with you, you want to remove all of that friction. And normally what that means is if you don't have a contact form front and center, you want to at least have a contact button that makes it really clear, like click here to start the process. And from there, you want to give people a lot of options in terms of how they can contact you. This again, I think is a common mistake where gym owners, and this is just a very common user experience problem, right? Gym owners often don't properly put themselves into the perspective of their their potential customers. And so they might advertise only the communication methods that they like. So maybe they post a phone number and nothing else. Big mistake if you do that. People hate calling these days. People yes. want to text. They want to do a live chat. They might do a Facebook Messenger style chat. And you can have a Facebook Messenger widget for your site, meaning a live chat function that actually sends it to your Facebook page, like meaning the Facebook page you create for your business. The chat goes into that inbox. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an important thing to understand is that, I mean, there's a lot of people out there like me who get totally crazy social anxiety about phone calls and just won't take them. I mean, if I have a bunch of products I'm looking at and one of those products says, here's the phone number, call us to set up a trial or to buy this ain't happening. I will disqualify those people right out of the <laughs> gate because I don't want to talk to anyone on the phone. So you want to provide multiple contact methods. You should have a phone number. You should have an email address. You should have a live chat if you can built into the site. You can also, like you said, you can plug in Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp right on there. And there's a lot of people who are going to insist on kicking the tires. You know, they won't be interested until they've come down and they've met you in person. You should also make it easy for people to just wander in if you want. I mean, unless you want to prevent that for some reason. But generally, mm -hmm. Generally speaking, it's good to encourage people to show up at the gym. Just say, you know, hey, here's our address. If you want to come by and talk to us, here's how you do it. The yeah. more options you can give for having people contact you, the better, because different people are going to gravitate towards different methods. Yeah. One thing I'll say is if you're not really there all day, then you need to be a little careful that you make it clear to people because some people assume your business, you're open during the day and they show up at hours when the gym is actually closed. If you're only open during your class times, if you don't have a person sitting at the gym all day. So those, those people will get frustrated and say, I came by the gym the other day and you go, oh, when? That's a good point. And they go, oh, two in the afternoon. And you're like, we don't have classes at two. And they're like, well, aren't you open? Aren't mm -hmm. you a business? Aren't you doing, you run the business all day, like a normal business? And you're like, no, I'm, you know, I'm a jujitsu gym. We're sleeping again. That we're taking a nap <laughs> at that point. You know? So sometimes people don't understand that. You just don't want people showing up and then the place is locked or the lights are off. That's a good point. You have to be totally, not just transparent about, but you have to make it amazingly obvious what your hours are because people might assume that you're just open nine to five like any other business and a lot of bjj gyms aren't like that just because there's limited demand sometimes for classes during the day or maybe the instructor's got another job right so very important if you're going to be requesting that people come to the gym that you make it incredibly obvious when they should do that as well yeah and one of the Troubles with that, I think, is if you're using Google My Business or business listing, as it's called now, and you set up your hours there, you can't divide your hours up. Like, hey, we're open in the morning from these hours and we close and then we're open. In the you just have to say when you open, when you close. And so if you do our first class is at nine in the morning, our last class ends at eight, it will look to them when they look up the listing, your business is open all those hours. So Almost better to not put your hours there on the listing because you can just have no hours on the listing and then on your website say, you know, 
please sign up for trial. We need to like let you in. We'll schedule it. Like a lot of gyms do that now. They schedule the first trial. They try to get people down that funnel so they're not just wandering in and you're not expecting people and they show up and you have to like divert your class schedule or your intention for your class to accommodate new people you weren't thinking were going to show up. Yeah, that makes sense. And there are a lot of reasons why you might just want to have a come by whenever policy, because like you said, even if, you know, you're totally clear on the hours, which might be a challenge for some gyms, depending on the schedule, even if you can make that totally clear as a gym owner, you may simply not want to have potential leads just wandering in the class when a class is ongoing, because it can be hard to juggle a class with juggling the sales process unless you have multiple people. So in a lot of situations, rather than encouraging people to just wander in whenever you might want to have them book a time with you. And like you mentioned, ton of tools out there now that make that super easy. Calendly is a great one. Uh, I use Motion for booking stuff like that, but there's a lot of tools for making it really easy for people to book a slot when they come by. So that's another thing to consider as well. In a lot of cases, if it's going to be disruptive to just have people just wandering in and asking for the sales pitch, you might want to schedule that and that can be part of the onboarding process. And you always have people wander in. I just have a plan for that. If you can't really devote a bunch of time to them, if you're a single instructor and you got to be running your class, you know, you might have to run over, hey, give them that warm welcome, tell them they're welcome to watch if they are welcome to watch and uh, capture their info, meaning name, phone number, email. How can I get in touch with you? Hey, would you fill out this little survey? You know, and some people will be happy to fill out all the paperwork right then if they're actually going to go through with doing a trial class at some point, if they're not doing it that day. Other people might just say, eh, you know, I'll give you my name and my phone number, but, you know, I'm shopping around and they're, they're like cagey about their info and go, okay, and have something ready to capture it. That could be on paper. These days I do everything digital. You get a little, little tablet for your gym. There can be a little... Probably if you have a gym management software, you could have a, a lead capture form. Honestly, what we do is someone comes in and they're not ready to do a trial right then. We'll just say, hey, you know, here's a tablet with our website on it. Our website has a lead capture form. I mean, a free trial form. Just fill in these three things, hit set, you know, submit and you're in our system. We'll call you after class. You know, we got to run back over. Hope you understand. You're welcome to watch. Yeah. It's also worth pointing out that in terms of the stuff you put on your website, A variety of different types of content can be a good idea because different people gravitate towards different types of content. I mean, as an example, for myself, if you have a video on your website that plays and introduces and explains the whole thing, I'm not going to watch it. I hate playing videos because usually Mm -hmm. anyone can probably guess I'm a podcast guy. I love my podcasts. I love my audiobooks. I'm usually listening to something and I don't want to play a video that's going to stop what I'm listening to. So I want to have text on the screen that explains things to me. But I know I am probably in the minority on that. The majority of people will probably appreciate having a quick like YouTube video that you just embed on your web page right at the top that explains the gym. But you don't want to have only that. You also want to follow that up with some text, right? You want to understand that different types of people have preferred ways of communication and preferred ways of absorbing information. And the more options you give, the more likely you are to connect with those people on the other side. Yes. And one thing to know is Google can't really watch a video and understand it very well, and it won't help your website rank better. But it can still be worth having videos because the humans like them. Great point. Well, some humans not like them, <laughs> not you. But so having it in text is the best way to do it, just so that it, that's something Google can read. And basically, that's where your keywords exist. I know some people, maybe if they've heard of SEO and they think, well, I just got to put keywords on my website, right? Like, how do I do that? And in the past, there was a way you literally just like said, here are my keywords. And they weren't shown to the user. They were just shown to the search engine who was checking the site. But that became such an easy way to create spam because you can say your website's about everything. And then the content is something else. So these days, Google's mostly looking at information that a human will read. And that main information it cares about is the title of the page. And by title, I mean that text that if you look at the tab in your browser, what text is up there? Because that's also likely going to be what they use as the blue link in search results. Absolutely. That's also what they say somebody bookmarks the page. That's the text that the, the browser will pick for the bookmark title. That's your main spot to include, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, self-defense, name of city, and the name of your gym in that homepage. And that's going to be the first place Google looks to to say, what's this page really about? It has to be summarized here in about, you know, one little little blurb, maybe like I'm trying to remember the character limit, maybe 90 characters, very small. 
how could I summarize what this page is in one little blue link? Then there's a, a thing you might have heard of, meta tags. Those are like the keyword tag was one of those. There's one called meta description. These are things that say, what's this page about? Honestly, they don't really matter. That's maybe blasphemy to some SEO people. The, the meta description doesn't make you rank any better or worse. It's just text Google can sometimes show. You know, when you look on Google and you get a blue link and under there, there's a little bit of a preview, some little excerpt. Yeah. Google could choose to show your description there if it thinks it's a good description, but it could also choose to pull text from anywhere else on the website and, and, and like show that instead. So these days, Google will rewrite your title tag into a different link and rewrite your description or show something other than your stated description about half the time or even more than half the time, but it will still use that title as the main spot it looks to for keywords, followed by this the content of your page. And if you want to know one other specific tag you should think about when you're building out a page, in HTML, so that's the, the code that a page is built out of, different things are wrapped up in tags that say, this is a paragraph, this is a link, this is a heading. And that heading one, H1 as it gets called, that's usually that biggest text at the top of the page that says what this page is about inside the the view of the page once you're on it, include your main keywords there. So that's where you just want to say Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in name of city. And then there's H2s and H3s and the, the numbers count up as they actually kind of descend in size and importance. So then your H2 could be, you know, martial arts and self-defense classes. And then you have some paragraphs of text and just write about it. That's the main thing I can tell people. Describe what you do in the words people would look for it. Classes, martial arts, self-defense, schedule, sign up, all these free trial, all those are the words people look for, put them on the website. Then Google will say, they looked for this thing. Your website's about that thing. Your Google My Business listing's about that thing. I think you're a good fit. Yeah, a lot of people probably aren't satisfied hearing that because it sounds incredibly boring and pedantic, but that's how Google <laughs> works, right? You tell Google the exact words that you want people to search and find for. So whatever you put in the title of your page and whatever you put in those big heading blocks of text, those are things that Google is going to weight especially heavily. So, I mean, that's not to say you want to stuff them with keywords, but those are the areas where you want to be very careful in terms of what language you use, because those are going to dictate what people see in the search results. And Google is going to weight those things heavily when it comes to figuring out when to serve up your page. So important to put extra emphasis on those. Right. And so, because as simple as that is, I've seen it done wrong so many times in my life because let's say you don't change anything, you don't set anything and your home page, your main page just defaults to title home. Yep. You know, and then Google's like, oh, I know it's a home page, but like, what's it about? And you're like, it's about home apparently, <laughs> you know, and it, Google will probably rewrite that for you because it knows that's a terrible title to show somebody. It'll probably figure out what the name of your academy is. It will figure out what you do and try to write a better link for that person or it doesn't and you just don't rank. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you just need to make it very obvious what it's about, what it's about. Don't hide it. Just put it right where it should go in the certain key spots you can put it. Now, what do you think about blogs? Because I know a lot of instructors get really excited about, I'm going to put a blog on my website and I'm going to update stuff on there. But usually people burn out with blogs pretty fast. I think people often, they might think it's a good idea, but when they kind of get an understanding of how much effort it actually is to regularly publish content on a blog, they kind of back out and then they just leave their blog stale. What do you think about blogs? Is there really any compelling reason why a gym owner should have a blog on their website as well? For SEO, I have not seen blogs do a ton for local search results. Google's not likely to pull in a, a blog that's just like, hey guys, here's our technique of the week or 10 tips for training. Because you know who's looking for that? Who's looking for that that doesn't already train? Who isn't already at your gym? So if you're going to write a blog, the ones I have seen do okay is like, let's say you don't have a good page on your site yet about children's programs. And then you want to go, well, I think I could go after like, a keyword that's maybe a little bit outside what I would normally write about, but like choosing the best after school program for your kid in and then localize it, like in, for our case, maybe Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I am or where you live. And then you write out 
a real blog post about that. And of course, you're probably pitching jujitsu as the thing they should do. So a blog there is actually helping you target a keyword and a topic that you didn't, maybe you didn't have another good spot to put on your site. But if your blog is just like, hey, guys, we're going to be closed for the holidays. Like that's just not really content Google cares about for yeah. sending new traffic to your site. If you're going to blog, make it worthwhile to you by making it something you would just be happy if your existing students looked at. Or I would say if it's something you could roll into social media, like sharing on your Facebook, Instagram, or whatever other things you use. And another use of a blog could be if you want to start doing advertising on social media, which I'm not a specialist in that, but I've seen people do well where they say like, again, let's say we write a thing about how to lose weight doing martial arts. It's like, hmm, people just don't sit down and go, how to lose weight losing martial arts. And they type that into Google and then Google thinks your business, like it just, that's not going to get you local traffic, local people. Yeah. But maybe you could target local people with advertising and be like, you want to get in shape and not be bored and have a cool picture of some guy doing jujitsu. Check out this, you know, article about blah, blah, blah. And then, then you're driving traffic to it. But that's really different than SEO. That's just paid advertising, social media advertising. Yeah. Internet advertising is an important and complicated topic that probably actually merits its own podcast. I mean, we do advertising quite heavily for BJJ Mental Models. I know if you're listening to this podcast, there's a pretty good chance that you've seen our ads on your Facebook and Instagram. Real sorry about that. But seriously, sign up for the fucking newsletter. Do it. (laughs) Do it. Do it. But anyway, yes, that's uh, it, it is a very powerful technique. And it's something that I think most gyms should look into, but a, probably a conversation we should save for a different day, because that is a very in-depth thing to talk about. I would ask you one more thing I'd love to know about websites here from your perspective. What about the pricing? Because there are wildly differing opinions on this, whether you should include your pricing on your website or whether you should say, contact us and we'll talk about it. I know some people who say that you should always be completely transparent and put your pricing on the website, but I know other people who say they want to control the conversation. They don't want to have to deal with these dumb price objections. So they insist on getting the ball rolling before they disclose that. Do you have any feelings one way or the other as to whether you should include pricing details on the website? I can tell you when we did Inverted Gear Academy, we decided we don't want to play that keep away game. We just tell people the prices. We don't care. <laughs> like, I know that some people like that leverage for sales, but then that usually lends itself to a sort of sales process that's all about the salesperson having more knowledge, more power, more kind of emotional leverage, information leverage over the person you're trying to sign up. And some people do well with that. That's just not how we wanted to run the gym. That's not the the process we wanted to go through. We have the pricing on the website. You know, we don't have contracts. We it's month to month, cancel any time. Because are you really going to chase somebody down who quits after a month for like you're no you're going to pay me for the next five months even if you don't train? Like some people will because they want that money. We don't care that much. Like you're never going to get that person back if you do that to them. You're never going to, that person might come back later if you let them out, (laughs) you know, but they're not going to come back if they're like, man, I I couldn't afford to pay. But they're like, no, you signed a contract. You signed in blood. You're going to be paying us for the rest of, you know, the rest of this 12 month contract. And you're like, I actually don't like it that much. Too bad. Too bad. We didn't tell you the price until you got here. And then you fall. And we used all these, you know, hard sale tactics to get you to sign up on the spot while you were all jazzed. Like, we don't do it that way. We just put it on the website. Yeah. There's plenty of there's plenty of systems you can get into, meaning if you want to have like a business system that includes sales that will say never ever share your your pricing. You know, people are going to comparison shop and they don't really know the value of jiu-jitsu yet. They haven't experienced it. They're going to go, "Well, I can go get, learn karate for $40 a month. Why would I pay 200 at a jiu-jitsu gym?" You don't want them making that comparison. I I get that, but also I just don't care anymore. I used to do that stuff, but I just don't care. The other problem, too, is those kinds of people who are making their decisions solely based on dollars and cents. And there are a lot of people like that, both for very valid budgetary reasons or in some cases, maybe just a real scarcity mindset. There are some people who will not look at the quality of instruction or the quality of the art and they will just say, OK, well, you're charging 200 bucks in the karate gym down the streets, charging 40 bucks. Therefore, I'm doing karate. That's fine. And I would ask in those situations, are you really better off wasting your time talking? 
talking to those people anyway, right? If someone is that hell bent on saving dollars to the point where the price is the sole decision making factor for them, is there any real benefit in you attempting to mislead them and boondoggle them and convince you to go down your sales funnel and then disclose the price at the last minute and lock them in, right? Because it, look, if, if the price is that big a deal to a person, they're probably not a good fit for you anyway, and they're probably going to quit after a month, and you're probably going to have spent a lot of time and therefore money chasing that person down that just didn't pay off. I personally prefer transparency and full price disclosure. I understand the arguments why you wouldn't put it out there. I can especially understand that if you're offering boutique services. Like, for example, if your gym package involves weekly training sessions with Marcelo Garcia, I can totally understand why maybe you wouldn't just stamp the price on there. But for most gyms, you're probably going to be better off just putting the price up there. If nothing else, it's going to save you a lot of headaches with leads coming in who will never sign up simply because the price is way above what they'd ever be willing to pay. Why waste your time dealing with those people is my thought. Yeah, I know that if you don't put the pricing on your website, the main thing you're going to get in your contact form in your live chat is what are the prices? Mm -hmm. And in the past, people would be like, just never answer them. Just always redirect it. Always avoid the question. Say, oh, you got to come in to find out. We don't disclose. And people are just going to be like, you don't disclose them online. Like, why not? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a real bad smell for the customer when that comes up, right? When someone tells you, well, I can't give you the prices until you come in, you know, that you're getting into what is pretty obviously a sleazy used car salesman tactic. And right out of the gate, that's going to turn a lot of people off. Yes, you might be able to use sales pressure tactics to get these people to sign up anyway. But even putting aside the ethical issues of doing that, you're not likely to set up a lot of long term happy customers. Yeah. It's very common. I mean, I've seen it work, so I can't say it's, there's no reason, but it's just not how I want to run things. It's not how I want to spend my time. It's not how I want to interact with people as I'm trying to form a relationship with them. Because the, the more traditional sales attitude is like, they just don't know what's good for them and you have to just make them do it. You have to control them, control the conversation, you know, overcome all their objections. Don't listen to them saying no. Don't listen to them saying I can't afford it. Don't listen to them saying I want to think about it you know, just close, close, close right away. And there's just so many ways I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. It, it, maybe you can, you can turn the numbers over and it makes business sense, but I don't like doing it that way. You can still succeed without doing it. That's right. A big part of it comes down to like, what's your moral compass? And I think a lot of instructors, you know, so many people got into the gym ownership thing because they got tired of the business world and they got tired of what that entails. And so you probably don't want to bring those kind of practices over with you when it comes to how you operate your gym. I personally think price transparency is a good thing. If we want to make a jujitsu analogy here, I would say that for some people who really have no business experience and they don't have any sales experience, these kind of tactics, like don't disclose the price. Here's how you make a guy not talk to his wife about making a commitment to a big purchase. <laughs> Here's how you question his manhood so he signs up. It gives them a system to follow, and that's often enough for somebody who doesn't know anything if they're not confident in just like natural, being personable sales techniques. There are techniques to sales. Like I'm not saying there's no technique to selling people. It's just what do they entail? How much respect do you grant the person? How flexible are you, are you are you with the person? So you're still, you know, you want them to sign up. Of course, you want them to sign up because you want to grow your gym. You want to give them the benefit of training, but you're not going to do it to just like get the number, get the sale, get the close, get the commission or whatever you're trying to get. Got it. Got it. Well, I think that was an awesome chat, Matt. Is there anything that we missed that you want to get into here that we didn't cover today? Any important tips for business owners, gym owners looking to maximize the use of their web presence that we didn't cover? Sure. There's a few more things I would say you should add to your site. And depending on what advice you followed earlier, if you if you got a Squarespace or a Wix, or you got a WordPress, it is setting up a Google Analytics. So that's the thing that lets you track how people are actually navigating your website, what they're clicking on, how long they spend on the site, how many pages they look at. So you'll want that. And that's free. You just got to add some code to your site. And a lot of this, the content management systems will help you do that. And then there's another thing called Google Search Console. Search Console shows you directly from Google what keywords you rank for, how high you rank for them, how many clicks they've got, how many impressions. An impression is just when you showed up in search result, whether or not the person clicked on you. And that will give you direct access to how you rank and what you're doing well for. 
And that will also show you if you're having problems with your website. Like if your site is was down when Google tried to crawl it, so the page wasn't available, Google will say, hey, these pages were broken, we couldn't get to them. And then you can fix that and tell them, hey, check again. It gives you a way to, to troubleshoot issues if you aren't ranking. And this one's a, a little more technical, but actually not too bad. There's a thing called Google Tag Manager, which is that lets you manage all these little codes you want to add to your site. So Analytics will have you add a little code to your site. Google Search Console does the same. Facebook Tracking Pixel, again, a little code you add to your website. Google Ads wants you to add a little code to your website. There's all these different things that want you to do that. Tag Manager is a like omni tag, meaning you add the tags to this thing. It's like a kind of when you're using it, it's kind of like using a Google dashboard, you know, a little Google website. You add all the tags there, and then the only tag you actually add to your website is the the Google tag, the main tag, the manager tag. And what this does for you is now you can manage them all from one one place. If you do switch CMS, meaning you go, I don't like Squarespace, I want to switch to WordPress, you just move one tag. You don't have to move seven tags. And if you want to get more advanced into it, if you especially once you start getting into advertising, if you're starting to pay for Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, and you really want to track your spending versus conversions, how many people actually went through with signing up, you'll want much better analytics and tracking. And Google Tag Manager has very advanced features for that to help you make sure that you understand where your money's going and how effective different campaigns were. So that can all be rolled in. Those are all free things, by the way. Just once you create that Google account, you can have a little checklist of going through once you have a website set up, analytics, search console, tag manager. Actually, tag manager should probably be your first one because that's where you're going to actually add stuff. And um, other tips would be when you sign up for a Google business profile, they'll probably give you a $100 credit towards Google ads. Google ads is a giant thing by itself if you want to really optimize it. But these days, there's a thing called a Spark campaign where Google gives you a little wizard that just says, you know, give us what you're trying to sell, what you do, give us a couple sentences, and they even suggest the text for you about martial arts classes and get in shape and gain confidence and all this stuff. And then set up a campaign based on whatever your budget can afford. And to, I'd say, just pick a radius, you know, think of what, how far do people reasonably travel to get to your gym and make the campaign based on radius so that when somebody searches and they're really close to you, you're willing to pay a little bit more for that person. So Google's going to show you at the top, the further away people get, the less likely Google is to show you because it knows you don't really want to pay for those people. If you don't want to pay for them, Google doesn't want to show you. And that way you can get a sense for how far out you can set that mile radius or the kilometer radius you want to pay for. You can lose a bunch of money if you just set that and forget about it and you don't track how it's performing. But they have made it a lot easier these days to set up a smart campaign that will get you started and then come back in later and go, okay, actually, I want to get more advanced with this. And then at that point, you you can you need more advice than I can provide you right now. Yeah, that I mean, that's a topic to me that is very near and dear to my heart. And actually, for all of those listening, if this kind of conversation is something that you want to hear more of, just let me know, because I would love to do more conversations about online advertising, about how to build online education platforms like what we've done. This kind of stuff is fascinating to me. So if you guys want to take a break from talking about arm bars and chokes and you want to learn about the scaling the Internet side of your jujitsu gym and jujitsu business, I would love to do more of that. So fan feedback, greatly appreciated if you got any. But Matt, thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. That was- I got you off. I have one more important thing to say. I just realized. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Get reviews, five-star reviews on your Google business listing. That's probably the best thing you can do to show up in the top ranks. And there's no special trick I know of other than just ask people. When people are happy at your gym, just keep reminding them, hey, please go leave a (laughs) five-star review if you enjoyed training here. If there is any trick, it would be Google will provide you with a little link you can share to people that takes them directly to the review form. If you can set up a QR code so people scan it and then it takes them to that link, you could put that in your gym. So anytime someone comes in and you say, hey, everyone, thank you so much for coming to train. 
please, if you haven't already, just go scan this code on the wall, leave a review. It would really help the gym. Just asking people. If you want to get fancy, you could probably automate this. You say, hey, after a person's been with us for a certain number of months, send out an email that asks for a review. I, I know people who will wait until someone gets their first stripe and then like the next day they'll be like, hey, congratulations. <laughs> Hey, would you leave a review right when they're all hyped up because they got their first stripe? Blackmail someone with a piece of hockey tape. That's fantastic. Maybe you go, hey, do you want a stripe? You can't get a stripe until you leave a five-star review. <laughs> That's how you really do it. That's how you get leverage. Makes and, sense. Uh, the, the other thing I've seen people say is, hey, rather than have a drop-in fee, tell people, hey, no drop-in fee if you just leave a review at the end of class. That's an awesome idea. And then you can get way more reviews than you actually have students. <laughs> That's actually a really great idea, especially if you have like a grand opening ceremony for your gym, because the hardest part of any new gym is getting that traction, right? The getting the first 10 customers is going to be the hardest battle you ever fight when it comes to your business. So if you can create the perception that you've got a lot of positive reviews like that, that is absolutely going to help you in the long run. Yeah, no joke. At the grand opening for Inveridigar Academy, we're just like, hey, you're all taking selfies. You all got your cameras on the mat. Please take this moment, go just look up our name in Vertigear Academy. You're all sitting in it. Google will show you our result. Location wise, you're exactly where you need to be. And if you could just leave a review, that helps so much. And then we got, you know, our first bunch of reviews from all these people who trained with us on that first day and all our first students. Well, let me ask a question then tying into that. If people do want to check out your work, your academy, anything else you want to plug, Matt, how do they go about doing that? Invertigearacademy.com will get you to the gym. We're in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is right by Allentown. That's about an hour and a half from Philly, a little over an hour and a half from New York City. You're always welcome to come through. I believe Nelson is planning to do some Globetrotter events of some kind or another soon. He is just getting back from Norway. He is a Globetrotter himself. And if you want to look up stuff I've done, I do not do too much jujitsu content on my own website anymore, but asopian.com, A-E-S-O-P-I-A-N. You'll find a lot of old stuff I've done. I've written a lot about jujitsu and there's plenty of videos. The thing that I do the most these days is most weeks, me and Nelson and Hillary, actually mostly Nelson and I these days, get together and we will film answers to wipe out Wednesday on Reddit. So we take the questions we pick from that Wednesday thread and then we film them on Saturdays and upload them. And at this point, I believe the Inverted Gear YouTube has a playlist of probably 300 or more Wipeout Wednesday videos. So these are just questions people ask. If you've ever wondered how many times you can film Escaping Side Control, I don't know yet. <laughs> We're still filming it every every few weeks. We just film another one because it's never it will never stop being the number one question Wipeouts ask. It's like a snake eating its tail, right? It just goes on for infinity. It's just, it, people will always want to know how to escape side control and no matter how much info you give them, it will never be enough. How to escape side control, how to not crush your nuts when you do an arm bar. That's fair. That's fair. Who was, Those are the evergreen questions. <laughs> this just came up actually the other day. I can't remember who, I think it was with uh, Rob Bernacki and Stefan Kesting. We were just talking about that. The uh, the plight of the male grappler and how often they castrate themselves trying to do an arm bar. Very common white belt problem. Uh, I just tell white belts they need to build calluses. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you're just going to get some cauliflower nuts. <laughs> okay, sorry. I need a second to recover from that. Amazing. Okay. Well, well on that note, and good luck with your websites. I hope your business is a success. You can always reach out to me through my website or find me on Reddit. I'm all over the internet. Just Or, hot plug, join the BJ Mental Models premium membership and get on the Discord because that's actually the best way to get a hold of me these days. Ooh, good, good transition. And before actually we plug that, um, probably worth pointing out just in case you haven't put two and two together, this inverted gear that we're talking about here is the same inverted gear as the awesome gi and apparel company. So whenever you go to their gym, whenever you buy one of their gis, whenever you buy their equipment, you're supporting the same awesome people. So if you're not already an inverted gear user, definitely recommend checking it out. At this point in time, I basically refuse to buy any jujitsu equipment that's not inverted gear. So they're kind of... I've kind of like unofficially sponsored myself with inverted gear stuff only. Highly recommend their stuff. A, re a reverse sponsorship. You sponsor us. It's a reverse sponsorship. 
<laughs> uh, but highly recommended. Um, but yeah, onto the premium stuff. Like I said, if for some reason the Facebook ads that I, I put out there haven't wormed themselves into your brain yet, best way to check out our stuff, of course, is bjjmentalmodels.com. That links off to everything we make. There's a lot more than the podcast. We've got a whole free database of concepts up there. So you can check out my crappy WordPress setup if you want to get an example of what the stuff looks like. That's where everything goes. So anything that you want of ours, you can find there. Specifically, what I always encourage people check out is BJJ Mental Models Premium. First week is free. It's an awesome value add package. All of the details are available on premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. That's the single most important thing you can do to help support the show. So please do check it out. Please do consider it. Again, if you haven't already, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. And of course, I'll put the links to Matt, all of your stuff and uh, BJJ Mental Models Premium. There will be links right in the show notes that you can just click through. Do recommend you check all of that out. Thanks again, Matt, for coming by. I really appreciate this. I think this was a super unique chat that's going to really touch a nerve and be helpful for a lot of gym owners out there. I hope it does. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And of course, to everyone out there who listens, appreciate it. You as well. Thank you so much for spending the time with us this week. And we'll talk to you next time. 